Welcome to section 2.9a. All right, gentle people, in our last lecture, we talked about something called the polyatomic ions. So let's go ahead and break this word apart. So poly means many, atomic means I'm gonna put atoms together, and this group of atoms are gonna form an ion. So what these are is I'm gonna get a bunch of atoms, I'm gonna bond them together, and this whole package is going to be a charged species. So you can think of these as charged molecules. So here is a list of some common polyatomic ions. I think it's a good idea that you guys go ahead and memorize this list, and there'll be a few additional polyatomics that I'm gonna highlight as we go through these slides. Now, the reason I think it's a good idea to memorize this is because these crop up a lot in chemistry, and it's a good idea that you don't have to look these up every time it's mentioned. So what I would memorize is the formula, the charge, and the name of the polyatomic ion. Now to give you guys an analogy, the polyatomic ion acts like one entity. Like I mentioned before, a molecule is behaving like a single particle. So if I have something like NH4+, what you guys can think of is that this is like a sodium ion. It is acting like a positive charge. When I have PO4 three minus, this whole group of atoms are acting like a three minus charged particle. What we're gonna do in this lecture is we're going to begin to learn how to name chemical compounds. So the first thing we wanna name are ions. So if I have a monoatomic cation, so that means that I have a positively charged species and it is made out of only one atom, the way I name it is I'm simply gonna put ion. So for example, Na is sodium, but if I put a charge on it, meaning I take away an electron, I would call this the sodium ion. And it doesn't matter how many electrons I take away. So the calcium atom with two electrons removed, Ca2 plus, would be the calcium ion. Aluminum, which loses three electrons, is gonna be called the aluminum ion. Now you'll note that these are the common ions. So if your atom makes a positively charged ion, and there's only one common ion of that, you just simply say the name of the atom plus ion at the end. Now let's talk about the transition metals. The transition metals do make positively charged ions. However, they can have a variable charge. For example, iron can be iron two plus, or it can be iron three plus. Now these species that can have a variable charge you have to identify the charge state. And you do this by using Roman numerals. So for example, Fe2+, an iron that has lost two electrons, would be iron, Roman numeral, two, ion. Iron 3+, where it has three electrons that have been removed for iron, well, that would be iron, Roman numeral, three, ion. And you guys can see that I've done the same for copper the copper one ion and the copper two ion. Now there's an old way of naming transition metals and this one is being phased out. But just in case you run into this, let me explain how this goes. What you will see is that if you have a transition metal, there are, there are variable charge states. Now what you have to know is the whole series of charge states. So for example, iron, the two most common charges are two plus and three plus. So what they would do is they would use the Latin name and for the one with the lower charge, they would put O-U-S, so ferrous. The one with the higher charge, they would go ahead and put I-C as the suffix, so ferric. Now again, you have to know the whole series. It's not that two pluses are always gonna be O-U-S. For example, the copper series only has one plus and two plus. So the one plus, because it's the lower charge, is the cuprous ion, and the copper two plus is the higher charge, it would become the cupric ion. So again, you don't need to know this because this is an old timey way of doing things. But just in case you see it, I just wanted to explain it. Now, one thing to help you guys memorize the polyatomic ions is you'll note that if it has a positive charge, the suffix on there tends to be I-U-M. 
For example, NH4 plus is the ammonium ion. So another positive one that I want you guys to memorize is this one, the H3O plus or the hydronium ion. This was not on that previous table, but I want you guys to know it because it has a lot to do when we discuss acid-base chemistry. And again, to reiterate, positive polyatomic ion, IUM as the suffix. So let's talk about negative ions. So things with a common charge, what you guys are gonna do is drop the ending portion of that name, and you are going to replace it with IDE. So for example, the hydrogen atom, I'm gonna drop off the gin part and put IDE, and so H minus is the hydride ion. Oxygen, again, drop the GEN, it becomes oxide ion. And then nitride for N3 minus. Now I want you guys to go ahead and look up what the halogens are. What you guys will find is it's called fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. Again, we're dropping the last portion of the name of the chemical and replacing it with IDE for a negative ion. So let's go ahead and talk about some of those polyatomics. Many of the polyatomics have a negative charge associated with them. So here's a little trick to help you memorize this. Now, when you guys see the polyatomics, what you'll see is that oxygen can vary in the polyatomics. And what you get is a series of oxygen compounds. For example, the nitrogen series has two versions, one with three oxygens and one with two oxygens. Now they're both the same charge. The only thing that varies is the number of oxygens. Now what you guys will notice in the series is the one with the most number of oxygens will get the suffix A-T-E. The one with the least number of oxygen gets I-T-E. So again, we can see this in the sulfur series. In the sulfur series, there's four oxygens and three oxygens. And again, the one with the most number of oxygens, A-T-E, the one with the least number of oxygens, I-T-E. And this extends to the halogens that form polyatomic ions with oxygen. What you guys will see is each one of the halogens forms a series of compounds with varying numbers of oxygens. One oxygen, two oxygens, three oxygens, and four oxygens. Again, you're gonna follow the same kind of rules. The ones with the most amount of oxygens will get the suffix A-T-E. The ones with the least number of oxygens gets I-T-E as the suffix. Now, to differentiate between two and one, what we're gonna do is the one with the very least amount of oxygen gets the prefix hypo. So what you guys will see is that this is hypochlorite. Now to distinguish between the ones with three and four, you're going to put per in front of the one with the most oxygens. You can see that this transfers over to the bromine series and the iodide series, where you get per for the most, hypo for the very least, and ites for the ones with one and two, and eights for the ones with three and four. Make sure that all of these things have ion at the tail end because these are all polyatomic ions. Some of these are not on that table, so make sure you guys can identify these. So let's go ahead and name compounds. So the first type of compound that I wanna name are ionic compounds. And the way that we name the ionic compound is we're gonna take the cation's name and we're gonna follow it by the anion's name. So let's take a look at this compound right here. So I know that this, this is an ionic compound because it's made out of an aluminum ion and the polyatomic ion nitrate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and name the ions. So I would have called Al3 plus the aluminum ion and NO3 minus, well, that's the nitrate polyatomic ion. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take the first parts and not worry about ion, and I'm gonna call this aluminum nitrate. Now, even though there are three nitrates, you never put di, tri, tetra, or any one of these prefixes in front of ionic compounds. 
Ionic compounds will never use those prefixes. What you have to understand is when you make an ionic compound and when you name an ionic compound, you're always going to assume that it is a neutral ionic compound. So when I say aluminum nitrate, it is implied that there are three nitrates in here because that's the way I can get a neutral ionic compound. We can go ahead and take a look at the transition metal compounds. So for example, CuI. So when you come across a transition metal compound, what you have to realize is you have to derive the charge of the transition metal because it's variable. So what I know is that iodide is one minus. And here I have copper. And so this makes a neutral species. So that must mean that the copper is just plus one. So this is why I call this copper one iodide. However, for this compound right here, I have I minus, but there are two of them. That means all the iodides are contributing a total of two minus as its charge. So to balance that out, the copper must be a two plus ion. So in this case, it's copper two iodide. And you guys can see NaCl as sodium chloride and calcium fluoride, again, working backwards. I know calcium in an ionic compound is two plus, fluoride is just one minus. So that means I have to have two fluorides per one calcium. Well, I hope that made sense, Chem 1A, and remember to stay safe.